G'day folks, it's Rog here, one of the pastors of MEC. Welcome to the service component of MEC at Home. If you're a regular viewer, welcome. If you're a first time viewer today, then a special welcome to you. We're going to hear from God's word, we're going to sing together, and we're going to ask God for help. For we are small and he is big and he loves to help his people. We're reading through the book of Ecclesiastes together. And I know for some of us, it's, well, getting a little bit tedious. I'm feeling that a little bit, you know, working through all these questions with so few answers. But friends, I encourage us to, to press on. For God is reminding us of our place through this book. He's reminding us that we are small. He is big. That we don't understand everything. We can't make sense of everything in here under the sun and we need Jesus who is the way the truth and the life to reveal God to us so it's my prayer that our hunger for Jesus will deepen as we keep working through the book of Ecclesiastes together you know one of the things I'm excited about right now is our three-year plan refresh now we had hoped to be further ahead with this but the lockdown has delayed things but the bright side is it's given the staff and the admin committee time to drill down into some of our strategies and some of our goals. And we're refining those and, and thinking through them fairly deeply right now so that we can present them to the church for consultation and prayer and discussion at the right time. So please pray for this period as we think through our three-year plan as a church. Why don't we pray to that end now? Lord God, we thank you that you provide wisdom from above without finding fault to all who ask. And we thank you, Lord, that your wisdom from above is full of, is pure and peace-loving and full of mercy and good fruit and submissive and considerate. Oh Lord, give us that wisdom that we need as your people, to live for you, to live well with each other, and to walk forward together in the plans and purposes that you have for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's sing together now to God's glory.
Hi Church, my name's Phil. I attend the 8.30 service with my wife and seven kids. Join me now as we pray together. We're going to open up with some words from uh, Psalm 139, and then we'll begin to pray. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today in prayer from our homes, unable to gather in person as your people, but still united in Christ. We call on the name of Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. We proclaim that he created the world by your side and that having died to pay for our sins, he is once again at your right hand. Father, we kneel before you and confess that we have sinned against you and continue to fall short of your will for us. Although we try to walk in your ways, our flesh is weak and we are torn by selfish desires and the pleasures and trappings of this world. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to focus our eyes on the things of eternity and to live for your glory and not ours. Help us, Lord, to find our security in you and not in the things of this world. Father, we give you thanks for the sustained control of the COVID-19 virus in our region and our nation. We give you thanks that the loss of life of the virus has slowed and that new cases are being detected early and are not spreading to the wider community. We give thanks for the government and healthcare workers whose efforts has helped us get to this point. Father, we are thankful for the lessons that we have learned throughout this time of isolation and restrictions. We are thankful for a time of rest, for the extra time we have spent alone in reflection or in the company of those in our own homes. We pray, Lord, also, that as restrictions now ease, that we might not forget the lessons we have learned through this time and that we might look closely at what parts of our former lives we may choose to resume and which parts we might leave behind. Lord, we know that this time has not been easy for everyone. We pray, Lord, for those who have struggled with this period and ask that now, as restrictions ease, that you would bring them joy and peace as they can progress back to their normal routines. Father, we pray for your wisdom and guidance as we consider the future needs of MEC from a facilities perspective. Lord, we do not know what plans you have in store for us, but we earnestly seek your will for us and pray that you will reveal it to us as we undertake this project. Lord, you have blessed our gathering over the years since you established it, and to this day it continues to grow. We are grateful for this blessing, and it is our will that we will be prepared for all that you want to send to us in the future. Lord, we ask that you bless the letterbox drop which we are undertaking in the coming weeks. As we stretch out our hand to offer practical assistance to any who have needs, we pray that you would soften hearts so that the offer might be received as intended. We ask that you would use us to bring genuine relief to those in need and to show Christ's love through this act. Lord, we give thanks for your support of home groups during this time. We give thanks that through Zoom and more recently through small gatherings, that the groups have continued to meet and to encourage each other. And we look forward to the coming weeks when the groups may be able to meet again in their entirety. Father, we pray for the work and ministry of Kelly Landrigan in France. Lord, she could not have imagined when she set out for France to serve you that she would be presented with such unusual circumstances. Lord, we give thanks for the church plant that Kelly was working on prior to the COVID outbreak. And we pray that they have remained strong and faithful during this time. We pray also that through these times, others in the communities have seen your love through the church and been drawn to explore the Saviour Jesus for themselves. Finally, Father, we ask that you would be with us as we eagerly plan to commence meeting together again. We give thanks for the fellowship with Medford Baptist Church and their willingness to share their facilities, and we look forward to gathering to encourage each other to live for Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.
Hi, I'm Fee and I attend the 8.30 congregation at MEC. We're going to read the Bible now, starting at Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 1, going to chapter 9 verse 6. Who is like the wise? Who knows the explanation of things? A person's wisdom brightens their face and changes its hard appearance. Obey the king's command, I say, because you took an oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave the king's presence. Do not stand up for a bad cause, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since a king's word is supreme, who can say to him, what are you doing? Whoever obeys his command will come to no harm, and the wise heart will know the proper time and procedure. For there is a proper time and procedure for every matter, though a person may be weighed down by misery. Since no one knows the future, who can tell someone else what is to come? As no one has power over the wind to contain it, so no one has power over the time of their death. As no one is discharged in time of war, so wickedness will not release those who practice it. All this I saw as I applied my mind to everything done under the sun. There is a time when a man lords it over others to his own hurt. Then too, I saw the wicked buried, those who used, used to come and go from the holy place and receive praise in the city where they did this. This too is meaningless. When the sentence for, from a crime is not quickly carried out, people's hearts are filled with schemes to do wrong. Although a wicked person who commits a hundred crimes may live a long time, I know that it will go better with those who fear God, who are reverent before him. Yet because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them, and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. There is something else meaningless that occurs on earth. The righteous who get what the wicked deserve, and the wicked who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. So I commend the enjoyment of life, because there is nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany them in their toil all the days of the life God has given them under the sun. When I applied my mind to know wisdom and to observe the, the labour that is done on earth, people getting no sleep day or night, then I saw all that God has done. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all their efforts to search it out, no one can discover its meaning. Even if the wise claim they know, they cannot really comprehend it. So I reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands, but no one knows whether love or hate awaits them. All share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good, so with the sinful. As it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes all. The hearts of people, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live. And afterward, they join the dead. Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even their name is forgotten. Their love, their hate, and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. Good morning, friends. Uh, my name is Michael. I attend the 10.30 service, and this morning it's my pleasure to uh, go through chapters 8 and 9 of Ecclesiastes and make some comments and guide us in how we should understand and apply this. Let me pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for revealing great things to us about ourselves, about the world in which we live, and about yourself. We thank you, God, for the efforts of Solomon 
if he's the author of Ecclesiastes, and his uh, sharp observation of life. God, as we wrestle with the theme of justice and the observation of death, that this morning you will be pleased to grant us uh, some humble and honest reflection and give us, God, some thoughts on, on how we might live in this life, under the sun, but also in the hope of eternity. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, because that's the two themes, justice and death. And we are arriving at the end of his investigation. The preacher has been investigating for uh, this book, throughout this book, the last uh, seven chapters, uh, investigating what gain might be had uh, from our labours. If we look at the world and look at uh, the things that we do in this life, it, is there reward that we can bank on? Is it worth it? And so far he's reflected that, no, it's... Well, he says, there is some gain, there are some things that are better than other things, but at the end of the day, the gain is like mist, like smoke. It's there for a minute or a second or two, but if you try to reach out and grasp it and bring it in, no, no hope. It's gone. It, it, this concept, this idea, is built into this word hebel. And uh, so there's been lots of things that uh, so far he says are hebel. It's hebel to chase after pleasure. It's hebel to chase after money. It's hebel to uh, think that you can grasp time and control and manage time. It's hebel because there's evil in this world. It's hebel because Death comes. It's Herbel. It's Herbel. And today he explores specifically the theme of justice. And it's the penultimate Herbel. The Herbel of unreliable justice. Unreliable justice. He starts in chapter 8 verse 2 with this observation that if you obey the king, you will not come to harm. He says, Obey the king's command, I say, because you took an oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave the king's presence. Do not stand up for a bad cause, for he will do whatever he pleases. It's very compact, very dense. But I think if I was to unpack it, I could imagine Solomon thinking of Shimei, son of Gera. Let me remind you of that story. Shimei was uh, a man born into the clan of David and of, of Saul. And we hear of Shimei on the day that David is fleeing for his life from his own son Absalom. Absalom has raised an army and with a general is pursuing David. And David I think with a great measure of grace, leaves the city of Jerusalem and leaves his throne in order to avoid civil war. But as he's fleeing, this guy Shimei comes out and must be sort of calling out from uh, the top of a ridge and curses David, the man of blood, he says. Curses him, accuses him of killing off Saul and his family. Of course, if you know the story of David, there is a great oath between David and uh, Saul's son, Jonathan, not to do anything of the kind. And, John, and, Saul, and David goes to great lengths to ensure that love for Jonathan uh, results in blessing for the descendants of Saul. Uh, one of David's generals says, says to David, how can you let this Shimei get away with such, such outrage, cursing the king? And David says, shh, don't, 
don't give him grief. Perhaps the Lord uh, has, has, a, has a reason for this to, for me today. That's 2, 2 Samuel 16. In 2 Samuel 19, David returns and comes back uh, into his kingdom. And Shimei is there on his knees and he asks David for forgiveness. And David grants it. Again, one of David's generals says, how, ra- you know, how could this man live? He has cursed you. And David says, shh, why should any more blood be spilled? But in his last words before his own death, David warns Solomon of Shimei. He says, do not consider him innocent in 1 Kings chapter 2. David observed that in this man there was something of a fault, a flaw in his character that made him a risk to Solomon and his kingship. Perhaps Shimei saw, saw himself as a, as a possible prince of the kingdom, a, a possible usurper to the throne. And so David warns him, do not consider him innocent. And so Solomon, later in chapter, in chapter 2 of 1 Kings, makes Shimei an offer. He says, Shimei, you can stay, uh, but that's where you must stay. You can live here in Jerusalem safely, but as soon as you leave the city, you will die. And Shimei swears an oath to the king, promises to do exactly what the king has commanded. And it lasts for a little while, about three years. But then Shimei's servants run away. And he hears that they've put up house in a Philistine city. And Shimei resolves, you might think justly, to go and collect his servants and bring them back. That here was an error being perpetrated against him and that he was right to go and bring back those who ought to be in obedience to him. But, But he breaks the king's oath and he leaves Jerusalem. And so when he comes back, the king, Solomon, reminds him of his oath and reminds him of the penalty and Shimei loses his life. Here, you have someone who uh, ought to have obeyed the king. And if he had obeyed the king, he would have been safe. He would not have come to harm, but instead, he does. Uh, I think that's partly of the, the, the... I think there's something in that phrase, do not stand up for a bad cause. Shimei is advocating for himself. Uh, perhaps he... Uh, you know, might have even said, I have got somebody I need to go and fix up, deal with, some servants who are disobeying me. But he should not have disobeyed the king and so took a risk there. Uh, This thought is reflected in the New Testament in, in places like Romans 13 where we're told that those in authority are God's servants are there for our good. That to disobey them is to incur their wrath. 1 Peter 2 verse 13 again says, honour and respect and subject yourself to the rulers that by doing good under them, you might silence the ignorance of foolish people. So there's wisdom in understanding how God's authority and God's justice in this world is applied. But, in verse 7, Ecclesiastes verse 7, he says, I I, I see that the wicked run into trouble. Uh, There are the wicked, uh, at the end of verse 8, that are not released by their wickedness. Verse 7 and 8, it's a bit like the uh, comedian, the wisdom's version of a comedy's joke. Uh, A whole set of points and then the punchline. Here, it's a whole set of generalities. No man knows the future. No one can tell him what's going to happen. No man has power over the wind. 
No man has power over the day of his death. No one is discharged in time of war. All things that we can agree with that make, that make sense. And then he twists it and he comes to a specific. The wickedness will not be released. Rele sorry, wickedness will not release those who practice wickedness. I think of, um, it reminds me of how difficult it is that when you've sold yourself to sin, you know, perhaps you've joined the mafia and you've uh, enjoyed their their company and you've enjoyed the fruit of wickedness, you try and break out of the mafia, impossible. They come after you. Wickedness will not release, will not deliver those who are involved in it. Uh, and in uh, verse 9, there's also the uh, this craziness that those who are engaged in wickedness often do it to their own hurt. I think of uh, people who, you know, might be selling drugs, might be taking drugs, uh, and, and they think that, you know, they're doing something good and, and fr fruitful for themselves in, in terms of pleasure or in terms of uh, money and, and generating an income. But their very wickedness means that they themselves suffer and come to grief. Uh, in verse 10 and 11, he, he keeps the thought rolling. Uh, not only do the wicked run into trouble, but they make more trouble. Uh, in, in verse 10, you, you've got a little picture of, of uh, the wicked receiving a proper burial and even praise at their funeral. Uh, that makes no sense. I think of um, this week we've had... Uh, uh, a slave trader's statue in, in the UK get toppled and thrown into the river. Uh, here's a group of our, our generation saying of a previous generation, this is crazy that we praise those who have actually been the source of great suffering and great injustice. Uh, verse 11 uh, talks about how uh, when people delay penalising those who have done wickedness, that encourages more crimes. Again, uh, we see it happening right now around us. Uh, there's no justification for adding sin to sin, but if you observe humanity, you will see this. It's been hard to watch our television screens with the looting of shops in America following the death of George Floyd. Uh, there's so much wrong with America's story on this. And I personally, I've, in the last two weeks, I've seen too many videos of violence against police, of police perpetrating violence against criminals, and scarily, against people who largely were innocent. So much wrong and yet some of those videos were stamped made in Australia. Our story is different but not better. Why is justice so hard to get? Why do our cries for justice seem to go unanswered? And then in verse 12, he probably comes to his conclusion on this theme. Although a wicked man commits a hundred crimes and still lives a long time, I know that it will go better with God-fearing men who are reverent before God. There's a little hint of hope here. It just is not enough to look at the world and observe the world without reflecting on God. There, there has to be something more. There seems to be something about the world that says the wicked will not survive. The wicked will not go well. But then he dives into verse 14. There is something else, Habel, that occurs on earth, he says. Righteous men who get what the wicked deserve and wicked men who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is Habel.
justice in this life is unreliable. It's confusing. It doesn't seem to be consistent. And so it's frustrating, desperately frustrating. When those who are wicked get what the good people deserve, when those who would do good get what the bad people deserve, it, it, it just makes us, I think, doesn't it? Throw our hands up in despair and say, what's going on? Certainly, you know, there, there is an appeal to pursue just causes, and I think we should pursue just causes for those killed in abortions. We should pursue just causes for those living in poverty in, in such great inequality. But at the end of the day, justice seems so unreliable. Does the New Testament arrive at a similar conclusion? The answer is yes, it does, actually, with a twist, to a degree. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus tells a story where he says, if, so, if your accuser has grabbed hold of you and is dragging you along to the magistrate, he says, make an effort to settle with him on the way. Because if you don't, the magistrate might hand you over to the officer and the officer might throw you into prison and then you won't get out until you've paid every last cent. Justice seems to be unreliable. In 1 Corinthians 6, um, Paul's talking to the Christ, Christ, Christians in Corinth saying, what are you doing taking each other to court? Lawsuits against each other? It's crazy. Why not rather be wronged, he says. Now, of course, in both of these, in Luke 12 and 1 Corinthians 6, in both of these, there is a larger story. There is a larger context, the coming final judgment. Jesus says this story of make, make an effort to settle with your accuser to bring us into line with God and his possible judgment on that final day against us. If you are being accused before God, quick, fix things up with him. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul's talking about lawsuits and he says, hey, don't you, don't you realize there's going to come a day when Christians will judge the angels? What are you doing judging each other? What are you doing fighting against each other? Why not rather be wronged? Now, the teacher doesn't come to the, that larger context and to that larger story because it's not part of his project. He set himself a very clear project of making observations and reflections on the world. Is there gain in pursuing justice? in this life, under the sun. And he, he, yes, there is gain, but no, there's not, because it's not substantial. It seems to slip through our fingers. And so he calls it Habel. There's Habel of unreliable justice. He does go on to say, well, there's only one thing that remains. Verse 15 says, the joy of life. But we're going to deal with that a little bit later comes to his final Habel in chapter 9. In chapter 9, verse 1 to 3, he says, there is Habel in the grave because all get it. Let me read to you a couple of verses. So I reflected on all this and concluded, he's reaching the end here, that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands but no man knows whatever love or hate awaits him. All share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. Our future 
to the extent that we can observe it, to the extent that we are under the sun, he says is in God's hands, God's in charge, but it's unknown, it's common. And down in verse 11 and 12, he says it's unpredictable. I have seen, verse 11, something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift, or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise, or wealth to the brilliant, but favour to the learned, or, or favour to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Verse 12, he says that men are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. No matter, no matter of, no amount of effort, no amount of activity in this life can remove us from the fact that we will all face death. This is the last one, the final habel. Uh, is the glass half full? There would be some, I think, particularly those oppressed, who would look at death as the great equaliser. At least my oppressor will get death in the end, you might hear them say. But I read this, probably the glass is half empty. Death comes to the person who is just observing and reflecting. Death comes, but justice has not happened. Justice has not been served. I remember the story, I remember being moved by the story of one Melbourne girl who was picked up by her date, uh, taken out to dinner, then dropped off at a house where she was raped by a group of men. I was amazed at her courage in pursuing justice. She had just the ticket of the movie that they were going to see. But I was grieved at the prospect of her success. Twenty years had passed when I read her story, and this was twenty years ago. And even then, I could see that death was what was going to catch her and frustrate any hope of justice under the sun. There's Hebel in a justice that's unreliable. There's Hebel in the grave, the grave that all of us will receive. He pauses to reflect for a moment in verses 4 to 6 that there is one advantage that the living have and that's hope. Verse 4 he says, anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better than a dead lion. I suppose he's reflecting on the lion, with his strength, while alive, meant something, but in his death, is nothing. Whereas at least a living dog has an opportunity to enjoy what he can in this life. There is one advantage for the living. We, we have hope. We have hope built on knowledge. We have hope spurred on by reward. And he reflects on those in those couple of verses and arrives at the conclusion. In verses 5 to 10 of chapter 9, he talks about God's gifts and he says, enjoy. Joy is the one thing that he can see in this life under the sun that is there for us to receive and to make the most of. He said this a number of times through the book, and here in this chapter, he says it in the context of the hevel of death. He says this, verse 7, Go, eat your food with gladness, and drink your wine with a joyful heart, for it is now that God favours what you do. Always be clothed in white, and always anoint your head with, with oil, Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love. Three things, he says. Eat and drink with joy. Dress up and smell great. I think that's the meaning of 
clothe yourself in white. You know, tonight's a good night. And enjoy life with your wife, he says. Three things. In the context of, and I go back to verse 8. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love all the days of this Habel life that God has given you under the sun. All your Habel days. For this is your lot in life and in your Habel labour under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it within, with all your might. For in the grave where you are going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. He says, enjoy God's gifts. Enjoy what uh, he has given you, your food, your drink, uh, a night out on the town, time with your wife, your husband. Enjoy these things because you can't take them to the grave. You can't take any of it. Jesus tells a story of a rich man who receives a massive payout. Life looks good. He gets ready to take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. But God says to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you and you will get what you have prepared for yourself. You can finish the story in Luke 12. This fellow, Jesus says, was not rich towards God. The grave makes Hebel for us. Uh, justice that's unreliable makes Hebel for us. But there is joy in God's gifts. And the New Testament goes on to say so much more. In 1 Thessalonians 4, we're told to live quietly, to work with our hands, to walk properly before God and before, our, before the people. In Colossians 3 verse 23, we are to work heartily as for the Lord and not men. And with respect to injustice, Peter says in verse, chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Keep your conduct honourable, so that when they speak evil against you, they will glorify God on the day he visits us. I'm conscious of the project of the preacher in this book. I'm conscious of the work that Solomon has, but has done for us. Uh, that it's a good work. That it, it reminds me that there are things in this life that I might latch onto, that I'm tempted to grab hold of and make them significant to me. But the warning from the teacher is careful. The gain from those things is not reliable, not faithful. You cannot secure happiness in chasing these things. There's way more going on than what first appears. And this is a, this is a warning that we need to hear. We need to hear carefully the critique of, the, of some of the decisions that we make in our lives. Thankfully, the rest of the Bible helps us to see where we should be placing our hopes, our dreams. Paul says, keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. There's great promises that God has revealed that carry us through the hell of this life and give us confidence and hope that all these things that are and make life difficult will one day be resolved. Friends, one day there will be justice. So live life honourably. One day you may face death. So live life now carefully under God's rule, following Jesus and loving his people 
and loving those around you, doing good to them. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, again we thank you for Ecclesiastes, we thank you for the teacher, and we ask, as our hearts grieve the injustices that we see in this world, as our hearts grieve at the pain and suffering of our fellow human beings, as our hearts grieve over the habel of death itself, God, give us comfort in knowing you. Give us grace not to seek justice as, if, as an end in itself, but to be under your care and satisfied with the work that you are doing and will one day accomplish and finalise. Help us, God, to walk with you to love you and to be your servants in this life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
G'day church, Steve here, and today I'm in the home of Ben and Alexis Keith with Sophie. Uh, thanks for having me. You're welcome. Oh, thanks for coming. And uh, I've asked them to uh, have a bit of a chat with us because they've been new to church in the last three or four months. And in fact, they stopped uh, coming to church three weeks after the lockdown. So they've been in lockdown and they've been getting to know church by TV. Thanks, Sophie. So I just wondered, uh, Alexis, tell us a little bit about your family, uh, Sophie. And... Yeah, um, so I'm Alexis, this is Ben. We're both teachers. Um, and this is Sophie, she's seven months old. Uh, we just moved to East Maitland last year. And we have two dogs, a Cavoodle and a Spoodle. And yeah, like, like you said, we just moved to MEC um, like in February and then the lockdown happened in March. So mm -hmm. it's all very new to us. <laughs> yeah. So how has it been getting to know church yeah. by TV? How have you, you said Yeah, well our first week we found it really, really welcoming. <laughs> Um, we got invited to a lunch after, straight after church, which we thought we were really impressed by that. Um, and then we got connected into a Bible study as well, which has been really, really encouraging. Um, we've met lots of new people. Um, we've had a few hard weeks with Ben's family, some of Ben's family passing away, and they've been so lovely and beautiful to us and praying for us, so that's been really kind. And um, we've also loved being having online church because mm. it means that you know, if Sophie's loud, which you can clearly see that she is, we can turn it off and um, watch it when she's asleep. So <laughs> that's been really helpful as well. Um, yeah. yeah, and yeah, we are looking forward to meeting together when Corona is <laughs> When it does, yes. That's right. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Thanks for that. That's so okay. tell us a little, maybe, Ben, about uh, what led you to move to Maitland uh, initially. Yeah, um, well... I, I got some work up at Madawi Christian School, so I'm teaching a uh, high school PE there, and um, yeah, it was, it was interesting, you know, we we were very happy in Sydney and in the situations where we were, but, um, you know, God in all of his wisdom decided that enough was enough, and it was time for us to leave Sydney and and flee up the coast, and to be honest, I'm, I'm pretty grateful that he told us it was time because yeah. we absolutely, lo absolutely love it here, yeah, so. Okay. So you may be a bit, even before that then, tell us a bit about you growing up. And yeah, okay. Um, well, I guess Alexis and I met uh, in Sydney. So I had just moved to Sydney from Bathurst where I, I grew up and went to school. Um, I moved to Sydney to go to uni. And um, yeah, I met Alexis at church. One night, um, I'd like to say it was the love at first sight story, but it definitely wasn't. Um, we, yeah, we met the very first night I was there, said hello, um, introduced ourselves, and then we didn't talk for the next two years um, until we started leading youth group together. And then, you know, we, we started talking to each other um, pretty regularly then. And yeah, we just, just decided. I think my mum met Ben at the fish and chip shop and said, oh, he's a really nice guy. <laughs> And then it kind of started. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh, that's good. So, um, just going back even further, mate, tell yeah. us, perhaps if you would, how, how did you come yeah. to know Jesus or what, what got you interested in knowing Jesus? Yeah, um, so I'm very fortunate in that I, I'm a minister's child. So my dad was a minister of an Anglican church. Uh, when I was growing up. Some might think that's a disadvantage, mate. <laughs> yeah. <that's what. laughs> I mean, mine was a minister too. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, he was very biblical, which was very helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was very much that I was always exposed to who Jesus was and, um, yeah, always knew about God and about Jesus and, and knew the whole story of, of, you know, his death and resurrection for us. Yeah. Um, you know, I did the, the typical slide into a bad crowd starting at high school so I slipped into some pretty bad habits yeah. there and then I remember one day um, sitting in an in-school suspension room at my high school funnily enough and um, God came up and hit me with a proverbial sledgehammer and said is this really who you're going to be um, and yeah from that point on I started to um, switch on to what was actually being told to me um, at church on Sundays and at youth group on Friday nights. Um, I went to a Christianity Explained course after that and decided that, um, yeah, Jesus was for real. 
Um, Jesus was someone that I needed to have a relationship with. Yep. He wasn't someone that I could um, sponge off my parents for. Yep. And um, yeah, it sparked a, a great big change in my life. You know, I, I changed pretty much absolutely everything about my life. I changed, changed schools, changed friend groups, changed um, changed people I associated with, and changed what I did for fun as well. So, so I remember you telling me before how important it was to have youth leaders who cared for you. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So um, my two youth leaders, they were they were absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, I had the same youth leaders from year seven through to year twelve, which was um, such a great help for me. So. Um, Two guys named Greg and Josh. They were they were patient with me. They were um, loving towards me. They showed me what it was to be a man who loves God. Mm -hmm. That um, you know, it wasn't something to be ashamed of. It wasn't something to be uh, frightened about. Um, yeah. I could still be a normal guy and be a Christian. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so the work that they put into um, just teaching me who Jesus was and that my relationship needed to be a personal one with him. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'll forever be grateful for those guys for that. I remember you telling me how patient they were. You know, they worked away with no real results. Yep. And they still did it. Yep. So. Yeah, they did not get to see the results of, of that, unfortunately. I mean, I have, <laughs> I, have, I have talked to them since I decided to become a Christian and, and they were over the moon about it. But yeah, yeah lots of patience with a, a very angry young man <laughs> that I was, so, yeah. Okay, yeah, so a uh, big shout out to the youth leaders there. That's right, yeah. yes, definitely, you do good work, guys. <laughs> so, um, just finally, as you're thinking about getting out of lockdown and living here long term, what are your thoughts about, it? Um, what are your hopes for living at MEC or what yeah. at MEC? I guess that we will continue to love and trust in Jesus and that um, MEC will become our church family, that we would uh, get to know the community and to uh, make friendships um, and we really want the opportunity to be able to serve um, yeah. and, and work out ways in which we can love others. Uh, Alexis and I both uh, were very fortunate to grow up in churches um, so we know the benefit that it is to have um, the knowledge of who Jesus is mm. from a very young age and that's something that's really important mm. to us. Um, yeah, and so, you know, being in a place where we have, we have loving Christian people to be almost surrogate parents to Sophie as they help us on this journey of um, teaching her who Jesus is and yeah. how much he loves her and what he's done for her. So, yeah, yeah. that's kind of our hope. Yeah, no, I think it's a great hope. Uh, well, thanks for being with us today and having Thank me over. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Really looking, really looking forward to meeting you guys at the 8:30 yep. a.m. congregation Thank when you. we return. We're looking yeah, forward we're to it too. Really <laughs> looking forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.